Welcome to Let's Face the Facts. I'm David Almeida, and I'm your host for this rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom The Facts of Life. I'm an actor in Orlando, Florida, and every week I bring you some of the greatest talent in the Central Florida arts community. Join us as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show, episode by episode. Hello again, guys. Welcome back. It's another week. It's another show. Another fabulous episode. Another fabulous installment from the series. And I think I have brought two of possibly my mostest fabulousest guests. If that's even a word, I just made it up. We are welcoming this week my guests, Zach Nadalski and Kurt Von Schmido. These guys are amazing. I decided to have them both on. They are uh, what one could call an entertainment power couple because they are not just theme park and vacation destination stars. Between the two of them, they have got some (laughs) incredibly prestigious and impressive credits on their resumes. Zach has performed on cruise ships. Zach has been on the Las Vegas stage. Kurt has performed at the Grand Old Opry and on Broadway in Cats and in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And Kurt is also a part of an a cappella vocal group called Voctive. And they have performed with some very famous people. And uh, you've very likely seen one of their videos through your Facebook feed, particularly around the holiday time when people are sharing music. Anyway, before we get to the show, though, we have a lot of business to take care of. First of all, it was brought to my attention. It was uh, Paul Padilla's friend, Reese, who wrote me a note to say that she went to watch the uh, episode on the Roku channel, and the Roku channel no longer carries the facts of life. It's like, what the, what the F and F? And then I went to the Crackle to see if anything had changed there, and Crackle still only carries seasons one and two. That's really all that they've done for for some time now. I mean, you can buy the episodes on iTunes, but you don't want to do that. The DVD set is $92 for the entire series. I I do have that, and I recommend it. It's wonderful because of all the supplementals and the extras. But at this point, really, all we have is DailyMotion.com. And God bless it, and thank you, Daily Motion, for existing, because those are the links I'll be posting each week, and hopefully they will still be around for us to enjoy the show until, as I have begged so many times, some platform to take on the series and post them. You can get literally every other show from the 80s, it seems, on Netflix, on Hulu, on Prime, and I don't understand why this one hasn't been snatched up. So, I've asked you before, please write to your Congress people. These are the important things our legislators should be doing for us. This week, I also need to welcome four new Tutti Fruities, four new people sponsoring the show through the Patreon page. I want to welcome to the family Amy W., Stella F., DJ, and Derek J. I can't believe I have four this week. That was like, wow, I guess those stimulus checks cleared and you people didn't want to go out and buy food or pay the rent or anything. You got your priorities right. You sent that money to me. So God, do I appreciate it. And I really do love you guys. And if you want to be like Amy, Stella, DJ, or Derek and support the show, you can through patreon.com slash face the facts pod. And you can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. Now, Getting back to this week's show, Zach and Kurt and I watched Season 5, Episode 7, called Advanced Placement. And uh, I do have to point out that in both the episode listing on Wikipedia as well as on IMDb, both of those have the title of this incorrect. It says Advance Placement, and that's not right. According to the DVD, which we have to consider to be the Bible, it does say Advanced Placement. And when the subject is brought up by Mr. Bradley, he does say, clearly, advanced placement. So, the episode originally aired November 2nd, 1983, and I think we are ready to jump on in. Let's face the facts with Zach Nadalski and Kurt Von Schmido. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from across town, double your pleasure, double your fun. (laughs) 
we have the husband and husband musical theater powerhouse team. Yes. Of Kurt Von Schmidto and Zach Nadalski. Ah, is there theme music here? Yay! Uh, he's Welcome. gonna applaud. I'm gonna applaud like I'm the studio audience and the guest. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, David. Oh. So, so everybody knows this is Kurt. So this is what my voice will sound like, and this is um, Zach. <laughs> and I don't know if this is what I'll sound like, but I'll try and be consistent. I'll probably get hired and excited at some point. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Actually, you know what? If if one of you could talk up here like this, <laughs> like Zach. Mickey Lawrence, how dare you? How and then one of you, you sir. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, this is uh, this is not my first three-way gentleman. Hey, but I will say this is the first time I've had two guests who are in the same room in which I am not. Oh, so mm. this is right. so it's your first stuff, Zoom three-way, is what you're saying? It's my exactly, exactly, <laughs> and I've just barely. Uh, mastered the zoom factor so why not mix it up and give me something new to fuck up right <laughs> yay yay uh, yes good time <laughs> always learning uh gentlemen did you do your homework did you watch the episode we, we watched it twice twice you oh <gasps> exciting yeah. you're you know it better than i do well, probably. We, we watched it once and then we watched it again and took some notes so like things that we wanted to talk about so yeah. okay yeah. good that's i yeah. love that so um, we've watched season five, episode seven, called Advanced Placement. Yes. It is, uh, the original air date was November 2nd of 1983. Yes. <laughs> it was written by Bob Meyer and Bob Young. They are also program consultants for the show. This is the first of 10 episodes they will write for the series, but this is, they have not written previously. Hmm. And in later seasons, they are going to be producers in the Over Our Heads years. And they will go on to write and or produce both together and separately. My two dads, Roseanne, 227, wow. Sybil, Happily Divorced, Mike and Molly, and Melissa and Joey, among wow. their many, many credits. Wow. And the show was directed by Asad Kalada, who directed the majority of Facts of Life episodes. So he's an old pro. We pretty much get more of the same right there. Uh, so before we start, gentlemen, let me ask you. I always like to ask my guest, do you have a relationship with the show? Did you guys watch this growing up? <laughs> Kurt is laughing the hardest. I, I'm laughing because I was a senior in high school when this came out. Oh, and, were you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and Zach was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, I always say if I, there we him, go. if I had taken him to senior prom, I would have been taking like a two-year-old baby. Hey, everybody. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to hit this in about 40 years. By your senior prom, I would have been ago. three. So yeah, oh, there's that. Yeah, but, true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Kurt, you're a little bit older than I am. I yeah. was... I was a freshman in high school in 83. Right. And, and Zach is just young and we hate him. So <laughs> right. did you actually watch the show in oh, its first run? Oh, please, though? yes. Yeah, uh -huh. it was one of my favorite shows. I liked it more the first several seasons when they moved out of the actual school and when she got Edna's edibles and all that, then all of a sudden I was like, eh. And then when it became like the Cloris Leachman years and, the, mm -hmm. and George Clooney, I was like, out. I, like, I quit watching it after that. I just... I like the first couple of seasons the best. You are a man after my own heart. I'm I have <laughs> said this the entire time. I've always said my facts of life, I feel, is the Eastland years. Yeah, of course. And once we get into uh, Edna's Edibles, it's kind of, eh, and then over our heads, it's like, what the fuck yeah. is this? <laughs> right. What's happening? Then it was just a completely different show, you yeah. know, and it was like cameos from the original people and it was like i yeah i was out by then yeah so zach did you watch it at all in, in reruns when you I, grew up well i have recollections of the show um may might have been in syndication might have been the in the later years might have been uh, original uh airings since it has what four more seasons after this five more seasons after uh, this? yes so that's great i love that we have the perspective of uh the seasoned pro who is familiar with the show and the uh the young innocent who uh, like many uh, of your generation, Zach, look at the show and go, what, what the fuck is going on? was yeah. definitely a, a moment. You're, you're not but, wrong. But we'll get into that. Oh, we will. So, gentlemen, I start every podcast by putting my guests on the spot. Yay! 
we always like to have a very short synopsis, just one sentence or two sentences max, similar to what you might see in a TV guide listing. I ask the two of you, you may collaborate, you may let one of you take over. What did we just watch? Do you want, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I think we uh, should each do one. Okay. Because <laughs> yours will be funny. My own, what did we no. just watch? Natalie takes the college class, gets a great big head, it gets out over her skis, and then gets brought back down to size. And the Beautiful. end. Yeah. That's spot on. It's man. a Natalie centric <laughs> episode. Yeah. Was, it is. I was going to say. Also, the other girls are there. Yeah, I was going to say, in this 22 minutes of your life that you'll never get back, watch <laughs> a lot of Natalie do a lot of Disney Channel acting. Hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, the, the acting style, too. Oh. Yeah. Well, let's get to the actual uh, play by play, blow by blow dissection that I like to do Ooh, of the episode. Yeah. Please. Anywhere along the way, if you have comments or thoughts or felts to be field, <laughs> let me know, and we'll we'll go there. All right. Yay. We start off in Edna's Edibles. Okay, have we discussed, have you discussed about how much funnier Edna's Edibles is now than it was when this show was created? Like the name. Just the yes. name, Edna's Edibles. Okay, we don't need to go into that. Matthew Arder insists that through the modern lens, one has to watch the show as though... <laughs> This gourmet food store is a drug front. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, the layers yeah. of their I don't disagree. Yeah. I do not disagree. Oh, that's yeah. funny. So duck yeah. pate is actually like code for yeah, some... exactly. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the Maui Wowie kids. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's why she has four she has two high school kids and two college kids. She's got it covered. She's got all the campuses covered. Mm -hmm. That's wow. true. She's yeah. got the connections. It's oh true. My gosh. Oh mercy. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> Mrs. Garrett is working. Blair yeah. and Joe and Tootie are there also working. And yes. in comes Natalie with Mr. Parker. Yes. He Mr. is, <sighs> in my opinion, I'm going to say Mr. Parker is the uh, Reuben Kincaid of <laughs> Facts of Life. I don't know who that from, is. From the, from the Partridge what? family. He is he just. looks like him. I know. He looks like him and he sort of sounds like him. And his purpose is just to be the male presence Yes. Of adult, of adult women of and his... children. He's the adult male presence in the show. Yes, of course. Yeah. Reuben Kincaid, for the uninitiated, is <laughs> the manager of the Partridge family. Yeah. And uh, I don't, vocally, I, I always think of Reuben Kincaid as having this sort of steady, gruff, yeah, Rasp a little nasally, a little started, nasally, and a little, a little rough. He yeah. started talking. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, there's an announcer voice." Okay, yeah, he has yeah, this. You know, yeah, Parker has the. And he's a very, um, I mean, he's a very <clears throat> seasoned actor. He had uh, quite a career previous to this and continued working afterwards. Yeah, and uh, in fact, he's been on the show regularly since the beginning of season two as the headmaster of Eastland. So now we're kind of pulling him from the school over to the the bakery. But it's like, uh, the show doesn't take place at the school anymore. Yeah, and they don't know how to use him. It's like... Yeah. So guess what, kids? This is his final appearance of all ten Aww. times that Roger Perry has Aww. appeared as Mr. Parker on The Facts of Life. This is his swan song. Mm -hmm. Moment of silence. <sighs> Glad we got to see Okay, that. seeing as how it's the only time I've seen him, I, that, that doesn't... I'm not going to miss him. Because, <laughs> like, he had the first... <laughs> <laughs> he had the first cringeworthy moment of the show for me, watching it. First cringeworthy show? D d tell me, what is a cringeworthy moment to you, Zach? I he hear did, well, I mean, there are multiple reasons that might make me cringe, but for him, it was this arm acting that is like, uh, a, I'm expressing something, I'm not going to do like, Bleh! like he did an arm thing that was like that. Oh. Like it just felt like a totally unnecessary and unearned movement to move. <laughs> And I just, it drove me nuts. And it was in his first, as he's following Mrs. Garrett around the the floor of the thing. And he does a thing. It's like a, it's like a, are you sure you don't want to come back? Kind of moment. And it just, <laughs> I, what is that? And I did not care for it. That is all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Zach Nadowski has yes. spoken, ladies That's and gentlemen. Right. Don't use your arms. I did not. Well, when I acting, mean, don't, don't overuse your arms. Yeah, don't overuse anything. Also, okay. goodbye, Mr. Parker, <laughs> yeah. and good riddance. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about the other cringe word. There was a cringe worthy moment for me, but it was Charlotte Ray yeah. later in the episode. We'll, so we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah we'll yeah. absolutely oh, stop me. Yeah. But you started saying about the girls. Joe was wearing the classic double shirt, which mm -hmm. I used to wear every day. 
You wear a polo uh-huh. shirt under a Oxford shirt. That was the look, and she had it oh, on. Yes. She was like in her red and blue, I think, uh, outfit there. So I just wanted to point that out. That I was like, oh my god, I remember wearing that like every day to school. That because was... when you were a teenager, you were also a lesbian. I was. <laughs> I was. Okay. I just wanted to be sure that we clarified. I was was dating girls. So, yes. Yes, if anyone. Are you okay? (laughs) (laughs) I've seen photos of him from high school. Yeah, I do do look sort of like a lesbian. I look like a. Oh, do you really? Yes. And he was voted most versatile in his senior year. Yeah, I was voted most versatile. That was my superlative my senior year. So, there you go. Wow. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Okay then. Sorry, you're learning that. a lot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, sorry. Um, <clears throat> with Mr. Parker's entrance with Natalie, uh, he begs Mrs. Garrett to return to Eastland, and that comes up again and again and, uh, and again. She does say that business is good, and she says she can't complain. But I will note, nobody's in the store. <laughs> Ever the, the only time that we talked about that, why would you need four girls and you to work your tiny, tiny store when we see we saw two customers? <laughs> yeah, it would make better sense that they were in the we, kitchen helping her to bake yeah, the merchandise. We didn't have the yeah. budget for the extras to be shopping in the cafe. Exactly. Yeah. Although they do, they do talk about Natalie's pay later, and I, we'll get to that because I was yeah, like, holy, that does come so, up. you get 20 cents an hour, Natalie. Yes. So, <laughs> what was the minimum yeah. wage in 1983? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Was... Yes. Well, um, Natalie is all excited because with Mr. Parker comes the great news that he and the dean at Langley College, which is the Ivy League college that Blair and Joe attend right now, mm-hmm. that they are putting in an advanced placement program. And because Natalie is an extraordinary student, she gets to take a freshman level course at Langley. Ooh. And this is uh, clearly a big fucking deal to everybody. Well, it okay. was, I'm going to say it was to me because we I didn't grow up in a town anywhere near a college. Our closest closest college was maybe an hour and a half, two hours away. Mm-hmm. And when you're that age, that mm-hmm. seems like a really long distance away. So some, thinking about somebody, their junior year of, she was a junior in high school, right, at that time, Natalie? Correct, yes. Yeah, being able to take a mm-hmm. college course. Now, very quickly, we do have a nice moment that I like where uh, a typical sitcom trope where natalie's like i'm gonna be taking a course i don't know what course blair and joe be my advisors since you already go to the school yeah right and they're like oh sure we're happy to give you our experience yeah and thankfully mrs garrett says what what 51 year old david is saying (laughs) yeah you've been at school for seven weeks yeah exactly you know nothing you know nothing (laughs) what did i know seven weeks into college nothing in terms of what they advise, though, like, I feel like as a seven-week college freshman, I would have said, oh, that's a really long walk to that hall. And also, do you uh-huh. really want to be up and at the college at 8 a.m.? I mean, the advice they give is the advice of a college freshman. <laughs> so yeah, I'm yes. going to give, to be fair, yeah, I'm yeah, going to give them that. To be fair. <clears throat> okay, help me, guys. You say you watched the episode twice. Yes. What is the name of the course Natalie picked? Tootie said it. Something drama. It's, uh, thank you. Yeah. Something, something drama. About, That's something literally what drama. I have in my notes. Yes. Like, like, like modern, modern drama. That's what it is. Modern, it's modern drama. Modern drama. Yeah. And she part didn't of me pick is like animals and art. That's the <laughs> animals and art was the one I wanted her to pick, but she picked yeah, modern like, drama. <laughs> but the thing is, being like an extraordinary course. student, the idea is that it is due to her academic accomplishments right. that she's getting this. So why, number one, isn't Natalie taking a journalism or a creative writing course? Because that is the career path that we exactly. have clearly stated she is on. So why there was this literally a sense of, doesn't matter what class, as long as it's in a convenient place at a convenient time. <laughs> right. Let's and, take the flunk course that Kurt would have taken if he yeah. would have been given this opportunity. <laughs> Not somebody who's a genius that should been is doing advanced placement. <laughs> Well, the course is chosen, and uh, we quickly... Oh, and the last thing I have to say. When we need to get Mrs. Garrett and Mr. Parker out of the room for the girls to talk, oh, the-, <laughs> the shop is still new. So Mrs. Garrett says to oh, Mr. Sure. Parker, So, would you like a cook's <laughs> tour of the house? <laughs> I, and, on the, I didn't even notice it on the first one. And on the second run, I thought... 
Let's start in my bedroom. It was, like, <laughs> wasn't the, it was like it was like almost flirtatious, but not. But you know, when Sarah French was on the show, this episode had the two of them like battling the school board and rallying the parents over some books that were being banned from the library. And Sarah <laughs> French pointed out that their chemistry was so good because they really had some meteor stuff to sink their teeth into as actors. Sarah was like, they are totally fucking. <laughs> and I'm like, no, stop. That's like, that's like you talking about your parents having sex. I was like, no, I will not believe that. But then. But then if you go back and yeah. watch it with those glasses on, yeah. you know, or that mentality yeah. of like, oh, they were fucking the whole time. That's kind of awesome. And there were earlier talking about looking through that lens. There were earlier episodes where he's like, well, Edna, can I convince you to take me in the kitchen for a bite of your strudel <laughs> <laughs> i shit you not actual dialogue from the show oh uh, yeah i so, have a lovely tuna casserole and they just sneak off and we don't see them again yeah. it's like mm. la 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 <laughs> wow. so that scene ends now we go into this uh, this new location, well, not a new location. Oh. We saw it before in the season premiere when we were first introduced to Langley College. It is the lounge in yeah. the dormitories. Right. Oh, and something I meant to point out in the earlier scene. Uh, in the earlier scene when Mr. Parker shows up and we have Tootie and Natalie, that mm -hmm. is the first time now in seven weeks of the new show, this new Edna's Edibles premise. Season that's one. the first time we see the Eastland uniforms at the store, oh, where we wow. get the sense that they are students Still at the school, school. <laughs> but commuting, <laughs> they're, they're commuting from living at a bakery to go to a residential <clears throat> boarding school. It's, it doesn't work for me, All but right. anyway. <laughs> but that is the first time we see the uniforms in the shop. That's just a thing what it, for whatever that's worth. That's amazing. <laughs> so let's talk about this lounge at the dorm. Uh, we have a coffee machine. It's not the same coffee machine that we saw all those years in the Eastland Lounge at the girls' school. It is a different coffee machine. Yes, I checked because I'm a nerd. <laughs> awesome. But there are other um, vending machines there. I love those and in machines. three foot high letters candy. Yes, yeah, soda. Another one. That was what chips. Yes. An entire machine for just <laughs> chips. It reminded me of Epcot. <laughs> 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 the whole, like when Epcot first opened, it's like, oh my God, this is what people in the 80s thought the 2000s were going to look like. Yes. What did I say from the Simpsons? You know that line? In the future, your candy and your chips won't have to share the same vending machine. <laughs> it's... <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. So in come Blair and Joe and Natalie. I'm just going to point out what the fuck are they doing there? They don't live there. This is the it's lounge a dorm. at a right. dorm. Now, I came from a, a big school that had, you know, tens of buildings that were all dormitories. Yeah. I don't know if this is a small enough school that this is the dorm and this is the lounge. Right. But it is weird that it's like, okay, Blair and Joe used to live here. They lived here for one whole week, Blair for two, before they moved in with Edna's, moved into the Edna's Edibles. Right. But the fact is, it's like, why are they hanging out in a dorm that is not where they live? Kind of weird. Right. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. yeah. And why does everybody there know Natalie? Like everybody uh, in the door, everybody in the lounge knew Natalie. And I'm like, they well, all she's just been here three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this leads into my whole trouble with this whole thing is that as a oh. freshman, especially if you've only been there, like Blair and, and and Joe had only been there for, you know, like you said, I think seven weeks. Who gives a shit about some seven week freshman at a college? Like I, I was invisible for the first year of school that I remember. Me, me too. You know, I think yes. we all were. And so when she's telling all the scoop and all these inside things, and people are laughing, why do they care? Everybody starts listening. People come around and want to know the dirt, and I'm like. Who gives a shit, really, about these seven-week freshmen that are there? Also, again, major leaps of logic for the premise of this plot. 
who, why is there a class starting three weeks into the semester, or however many weeks into the semester? Seven. Seven, seven weeks seven into weeks. the semester. So the girls have already been there, The two, Joe and... Yeah. Yes. ...have already been there for seven weeks. And now Natalie is going to start taking a college class... It like yeah. did we just jump to the next semester? Are we supposed to believe this is now January? That can't be. And that I know, can't right? Be. So it's like, so what college right. class is starting seven weeks into the semester? It j- yeah. yeah makes no, no sense. You're you're not wrong. You are not wrong at all. I do need to point out a couple of actors in this scene. Oh, the please first do. one is the actor, the blonde guy with the super amazing feathered hair. God, and we hair, looked him up. We looked him up online. Hair, like, looked, oh, you did. Yeah. The hair in this scene, oh, is amazing. It that was is, my it hair. Eighties tastic. I had eighties hair. Oh. The actor's name is David Tiefen. We've seen him before because he was in the dorm earlier. Oh, he actually, we saw him. He was the guy in the towel, oh. and this is his third of six appearances in the role of Guy Reynolds. Mm. So we will see more of him. We we have already seen more of him. <laughs> we will see more and more of him. Oh. Um, and the other thing is, there's a girl sitting at the table is part of the conversation and she's credited with the character's name of Alicia. Now this is her second appearance on the show. She is billed also as Alicia, the same character in the Gamma Gamma or Bust episode where Blair and a bunch of girls were all pledging Pledging. the Gamma Gamma sorority on campus. Alicia was at the pledge party and so she's back in the dorms now. We have to assume that Alicia pledged and the sorority said, nope, fuck off. We don't want you. <laughs> so, okay, I have a question. Not knowing because I was trying to figure this out and I didn't go back and watch that other episode. Is Blair a Gamma Gamma? She chose not to pledge. Is that what happened? Blair is not. In- okay. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, I was trying to figure that out the whole time. It was like, is Boots trying to rub in that she's not in Gamma Gamma or not living in the in the sorority house, but she is a gamma. It was just really hard to tell what was happening there, except that Boots was really trying to rub it in to Blair. And Blair was yeah. like, fuck off. I don't fucking care. Yeah. I think Blair could okay. come back to it if she so chooses, but I don't believe she ever does. Okay. But but thank you for bringing that up, because in addition, we have uh, we have the wonderful Jamie Gertz as oh. Boots St. Clair. I love her. Her second of four appearances. I have so many things to say about her. <laughs> and she, I mean, we we met her in the last episode. In this episode, she has really blossomed in the role. Okay. And by blossomed, I mean she is playing to the back, back of the football field. <laughs> yes. It's like she's in a different show. Woo. That's what we were saying. It's like, oh, my gosh. Woo. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Everything More so. was so over the top. Yeah. Just, oh, oh, my yeah. God. Hi, everybody. Mind if I mix? Oh, thank, thank you, Natalie. You. Right. She Just is in a different ex- show than everyone exactly. else is. Yeah. Not to say that there's not other Disney Channel acting on this episode, but <laughs> she is the queen of the Disney Channel acting on this yeah. episode. She I is love Muffy, it. Buffy. And, yeah. Well, it's because of that SNL sketch. Uh, that like the Disney Channel School of Acting that <gasps> Hannah Mon- um, Miley Cyrus did. You've got to see this. Oh, if you've not okay. seen it, please look that up. Everybody was yelling like they were in a high school play with no audio equipment. Yeah, yes. Kim Fields is the loudest of the bunch. Yes, and, and it's like at some point she got before. a note that she was quiet, and so <laughs> now she's over. She's like overcompensating always. The interesting thing about the dynamic here, the show is still kind of re trying to figure out what it is in this new format. And I think it was definitely a strong consideration to have Jamie Gertz be a regular on the show. Mm. And what they're setting up here is she's really kind of a hyper Blair. She's doing all of the stuff that Blair was doing in earlier seasons. That was a constant source of annoyance for Joe. So in this episode, we get her doing that. And as she leaves, Joe is the one that turns around and says, is everybody nauseous or is it just me? I love Joe's things. Like every time Joe has a line, I call it drive-by comedy. Because it's just yes. a, mm, yeah, I'm going to say this as mm-hmm. I'm passing by. It's a one-liner. That's all she gets. That's how they used her later on. You know, once the, her... The Eve Arden is yeah, what well, Yes, her. once her storyline mm-hmm. had arced, you know, yep. then you're like, well, now what? how do we she's, use her? She's the drive-by. Yeah. Blair, she was good she's at it. great and at I felt it, like, But in the course of this thing, and again, Bootsy, 
Why are you hanging out at the dorm? You have your own sorority house, and at the moment you are so she can lord it over the commoners, of course. But it's like, what? Okay, what are you doing there? You have other places to be, (laughs) among which class, because it's a fucking college. (laughs) Just saying. Uh, Yes, we learned that Natalie's been there three weeks. She's doing well at school, and Bootsy says that she knows somebody. At the newspaper, maybe they could do an article about her. And Natalie's like... Oh, right. The plot. The Sorry. Plot. We got yes. a little sidetracked. And, <clears throat> and Natalie says, well, maybe I could write it. And I'm like, good. That was a good um, writing thing of, like, Natalie is the writer. Have her write the article herself. Okay. And then very quickly, Blair and Joe are like, mm-hmm. I thought you were supposed to be writing the sketches for the... What is it called? Senior, Senior spoof. spoof. Yeah. This thing that is apparently a tradition at Eastland that we have not heard about. Never talked in about before. Four years, oh. ever. <laughs> and oh, Natalie's like, oh, please, the senior spoof is easy. And they're like, really? And they said, oh, Blair and Joe were seniors last year. You must have really lambasted them because we care so much about them. Seven weeks new to the school. <laughs> so quickly, Natalie starts spilling the tea about the things that the they spoofed Blair and Joe about the previous year. Like that time Blair got sprayed by a skunk and months after they were still calling her Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> no one remembers that. That's hilarious. Because it never fucking happened. happened. Yeah. I know. I was there. Right. I've watched every episode up until right. now. That did not fucking happen. Right. I know, right? <laughs> like, if that happened, why wasn't it an episode? Yeah. That's exactly. Celia. Somebody in that school would still be calling her Pepe Le Pew to this day. Is somebody... Um, and yeah. It's just so silly. And the thing is, maybe I can't think of any example but why couldn't they have found something that was connected to something like, embarrassing that actually yeah. happened on the show yeah, yeah. which yeah. they do come up with they do have um joe went to stone academy which is the military academy nearby and because she walked around with her helmet and her leather jacket on they thought she was one of the boys it's like yeah that's kind of close to home right and it's so weird that natalie drops these things and they all are just like ah! oh my god i can't believe that yeah. that happened Gather round, extras, and, gather round. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the true one that she does say is that Joe wanted to become a nun. And they're like, what? And that's true. That was a two parter. Yeah. Uh, oh, because, wow. cool. Uh, because Blair's half sister played by Eve Plum. Jan Brady. <gasps> yeah, Jan Brady. <gasps> really? Oh. We've mm-hmm. been watching the very Brady renovation. So. <laughs> the, isn't that the best? Oh, yeah. Love it. I it just love finished it. Show. Just finished the so Christmas much. Yeah. I uh, love it. Sorry. Um, the deal is, I, I think the Joe wanting to become a non episode is, I think, arguably one of the worst episodes oh, really? thus far. Like, <laughs> okay. I think it should be struck from the canon. That's my. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That's pretty bad. But the okay. fact that they do a callback here to it, okay. It's good. Yeah. Natalie, you want to give them shit for something? Consistency. Yeah. You want it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you want to give Joe shit for something? Yeah. That's a pretty far step out of character. Okay. Anyhow, Blair and Joe are not happy over this. <laughs> Before we move on from this scene, yes. I just have to call out that one extra guy who has the perm of perms. Just. Mm-hmm. It is like it is like Corey from Boy Meets World, <laughs> early seasons, times three. It is oh, just yeah. like just all it it, was, again the hair in this in this scene just brings me joy, just joy, it's joy, 80s joy. Cast they captured down in my heart. They captured the eighties down in my heart. Eighty three perfectly. <clears throat> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then the next scene, we move on to the store. There are two customers in the store, which Natalie I want to two. point out. The first customer. That comes up and pays for her thing. Best acting in the entire show. Agrees. She yeah. has, she has like maybe two lines, one, one line. line. She I pays like for her pay shit. For it's four seventeen, so she has to wait for her change. And she shifts her bags over and gets her change and leaves. And, and leaves. it was like She's it was the, the best acting in the show. Who didn't overact <laughs> the entire? Episode. It really was. The other extras awesome. that had to wait to be served and all that stuff. I'm like she was. She uh, she had one line or two lines in that. Uh, maybe I'll come, come back. back. Later. Later. Like, what? Are, who talks like that? Mm-hmm. Anyway. Can, you want to know the funny thing? Tell she me. She does come back later. <gasps> what? How many episodes? She is in another episode later this season as just, same thing, customer number one or two. So oh. they use that actress again. Okay. So, she so she's an addict, So she is what you're saying. They didn't lose her business, is what you're saying. Mrs. Garrett okay. Strudel is that good. <laughs> Strudel. And by Strudel, I mean... 
heroin. Heroin. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, that's oh. Fun. Uh, we have a joke here. I don't know if you guys caught this. Uh, Natalie wrote the... Um, Natalie's busy writing and shirking her responsibilities. Mrs. Garrett has to intervene. Boots shows up and we learn that in addition to juggling everything, not having yet written the senior spoof sketches that Tootie so desperately needs because there's a production meeting coming up, she's also... Picking up Boots' is dry cleaning, ironing her skirts, and helping her to pack her things and move while the sorority house is being renovated. Right, and there's a mistake there because Natalie says, I don't do her laundry, I'm just picking it up. And then two seconds later she goes, you learned a lot about a person when you're ironing their skirts. And I'm like, Thank what? you. You're doing laundry if you're, you're ironing You're doing laundry, skirts. you whore. Yeah. And our last bit of information is that Natalie has clearly gotten too big for her britches has yeah. bitten off more than she could chew, and these words actually come out of her mouth. You want some sitcom writing? Here it is. You're just jealous I'm doing better at college than you are. Ooh. Oh, bitch, you did not. Sip the tea. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> and, Blair's, and, and they're over there taking their earrings off. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Hold my, Hold my weave. My weave. <clears throat> Hold my weave. Hold my jewelry. <laughs> Hold my baby. But, uh, yes, they're like, girl, Get the fuck off your high horse. You are taking just one course. For now, is her response. What? I went to the admissions office. And Natalie divulges that. She has arranged it and figured out that if she takes extra courses this summer, she can skip her senior year at Eastland and enter Langley in the fall. And on that note, she leaves with Bootsy's dry cleaning and we fade to black. And she says something weird as she walks out the door. She says, Oh, is it the ta? Ta! And it gets a huge, huge laugh. laugh. It's really weird. When Natalie walks, she walks the door, over yeah, the door. Yeah, ta, because I think goes, that's how Bootsy ta! exited. And then leaves. Yeah, and it's it, like, was, why it was, it was, it was a Bootsy funny? style. Yeah, yeah Bootsy yeah. style exit is what that ended yeah. up being. Well, okay. So <laughs> we leave it on that note. And I just have to point out. Typically, you have the fade to black in the commercial on the, ooh, on a dramatic moment, on a a thing or a problem or a complication. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to lie. Part of me is like, is is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, it's bad that Natalie's clearly getting a swollen head over all this. But it's like, I'm going to skip my senior year and go to college early. Yeah. And it's like, that's that's good and yeah I mean, why 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 would that be a necessarily yeah. well, a bad well that's thing. good but just the way she's being yeah the way she's yeah acting. maybe by then you won't be a cunt but yeah, you know exactly. it's like that's what i wanted to say i was trying to I'm just say, gonna pull out yeah. say that. well gentlemen this yeah. is the commercial break now okay and on the commercial break i like to take a little time and get to know my guests oh my God. introduce oh. them to my tens of listeners oh yay so uh i would love to take a really quick moment for each of you to give a little travelogue of your life and your career and so let's start i'm reading left to right so i'm starting with zach zach nadalski tell me where were you born i was born in princeton west virginia Oh, okay. Southern West Virginia in the mountains. Uh, tell me how how did you get into performing and tell me where you studied and uh, how did you get oh, here mercy. to Central Florida? Uh, okay. Well, so I was, like I said, I was born in Southern West Virginia, but I was raised uh, outside of Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, I moved there before I started. I think I was still in preschool when he moved. So I like really spent my entire childhood in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. um, or in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, I should say. And... Um, I uh, always, uh, I mean, I always liked to sing and I sang in church from like, from a really early age and in choirs and, and everything. And um, then uh, in high school did all the school shows as soon as I could audition for like the school musical and the school plays, I auditioned for all those things and did all those things and um, was in a kid's performance group called the North Star Kids, which was like a Broadway review group. Uh, in uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, which was kind of really started my love of musical theater, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went to school uh, at Vanderbilt University. And where is that located? I should probably know. In Nashville, Tennessee. It is in Nashville. Yeah. Did mm-hmm. not actually went to school to be a secondary mathematics education major. What? Yeah. What? 
got a got a almost a full ride to major in wow. math education. Wow. Um, and I part of the reason I chose the school was the scholarship, and also partially because I they had a good music an undergraduate music program, mm-hmm. uh, a school of music that I could keep taking voice lessons at. Uh, Because I still wanted to do that, but I didn't think it was going to be my career. Called the the Blair School of Music, by the way, which I think is relative to today's stuff. The Blair (laughs) School of Music. (laughs) Isn't it great? (laughs) So then, you know, uh, so I started school. A lot of stuff happened in college. um, But, uh, and after two years, I finally realized, oh, why am I telling myself I'm not good enough to do this as a career, to be a performer? I think that was a a great big hurdle in my own head when I finally decided, Oh, maybe I am good enough to have a career Mm -hmm. in music and in theater. Uh, and at that point, and a lot of that had to do with my voice teacher kind of Mm -hmm. at one point I had a really good lesson and he said, why aren't you doing this? Why, why aren't you one of my full-time students? Nice. And I I think I said for the first time out loud, I don't know if I'm good enough. He's like, well, that's crazy, you know, or whatever he said. And, and um, that started the shift. And anyway, eventually I changed, uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I changed my major to music. I transferred to the school of music. I added an extra year into my education and I graduated in 2005 with a degree in a bachelor of music in voice performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I just started doing the big regional auditions with the United Professional Theater Auditions in Memphis and got a little bit of work as an acting intern uh, in Roanoke, Virginia for a year, for a season. Um, mm-hmm. And then while I was there, which when I, was when I went to the Memphis auditions, that's where Disney saw me. Uh, uh-huh. that, and unbeknownst to me, they were looking for a new Gaston at the time. And they mm-hmm. filmed me singing all of Gaston's music from Beauty and the Beast and offered me a job at Disney mm-hmm. World, which brought me to Disney in 2006. Uh, I, I left. I haven't been here the whole time. Um, mm mm-hmm. In yeah, 2009. The, 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 standard, the standard off and on life that we often find ourselves as quote unquote full timers at the yeah, parks. Yeah, in 2009, I, I, like, I went to Las Vegas for six months and did a contract in Don Arden's Jubilee on the Las Vegas Strip. And then I worked in cruise ships for two or three years. Or no, for two mm-hmm. years. Um, and, uh, and then I came back and kind of when I was coming back to town, because Orlando felt like home, that was when I got the job offer at. Uh, Full time at Finding Nemo, which so that just mm-hmm. the timing of that worked out perfectly for me. And uh, you know, I've gotten to do some other theater around the state of, mm-hmm. of Florida, and uh, just keep on trying to keep on growing and keep on working. Yeah, are you still full time at Nemo, or are you? Yes, I mean, oh, you yes, are as of now furloughed, but still contract. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, of course. Okay, and your talk of the of battling the critical inner voice, mm. that thing. It is all of us artists. If um, I could see, I could see Kurt is also making the face of like constantly. We are always questioning ourselves of, mm-hmm. you know, how am I good enough to do this? I yeah, they uh, they don't want me for this role. I'm going to audition for. Ugh, it is so tough to have to constantly mm. uh, silence and ignore and learn to deal with that voice. Yeah, to me, RuPaul's Drag Race is the only show that really displays that in its full glory because oh. what those queens go through, seriously, they all talk about the how inner demons their inner of... demons and battling their, their confidence and all that, but they talk mm-hmm. about it so openly and get so emotional about that's it. True. But I'm like, oh, that's every actor, performer on the planet. Yes, true. Mm. Well, thank you, Zach, for that uh, little travelogue of your life and career. You're welcome. I'm I'm continuing to read from left to right, and who do we... Oh, Kurt! Kurt von (laughs) Schmidt. Hello! Hi! Hi! Uh, Talk to me. I've worked with Zach a little bit. Zach, you and I did a concert version of Sweeney Todd back in 2009. (gasps) Right before I left town, yes. 11 years ago. Yeah. I I remember you were preparing. That's right. You were preparing for Vegas at the time. I literally entered rehearsals for Jubilee late so that I could do Sweeney Todd. But Kurt, I know you less well than I know Zach. Right. Which is already limited. So <laughs> talk to me. This is going to be very educational for me to tell me where did you uh where did you grow up and what brought you to the stage and where did you educate oh yourself? Oh my gosh, I try to I'll, I'll try to abridge my I've lived a long life. Um I'm, so I'm from Middle Tennessee outside of Nashville is where I was born and mm-hmm. uh 
raised Middle West Tennessee, uh, went to college at Middle Tennessee State University. I was a trumpet player growing up, played piano since I was five, um, sang a little bit in like church stuff. My dad led the music in our church when we were growing up. My mom played the organ and piano, so that's how I learned how to play piano. Um, but mm-hmm. wasn't a singer. I thought I was going to, when people would ask me as a child what I wanted to do, when I grew up, I said, I want to play piano in a bar and have people put money in a glass and tell me to play the piano because thinking awesome. I could yeah. get paid to play piano, just sit there and play piano, and people were going to put money in a jar. Yeah, that just yes. I think I saw that on the news or something once when I was That's a kid. That's a great job. Yeah. I wish I could yeah. do that. Jesus. So my senior year of college, my, my band director, or my end of my junior year, my band director was like, you're a great trumpet player, but there's a lot of those. If you want to go to college, I wanted to go to Middle Tennessee State University. They have a great, good music program there. He said, you need to change over to tuba. You're a big guy. You can carry the tuba. And you'll, I guarantee you'll get a scholarship. So my senior year, I switched over and played tuba in concert band, marching band, got a scholarship <laughs> to, to oh. college. Uh, and so I went in thinking I was going to be a band director because okay. I, I yeah. didn't know. I want to do something with music. And they're like, mm-hmm. well, if you don't know what you want to do, we have this great music industry program. It covers everything. And it was outside of Nashville. So <clears> you do a lot of classes that were in studios in Nashville. So I did studio recording. And oh, that's yeah. when I started thinking, well, maybe I want to be a country singer. That's what I should do is I want to be a country music singer. So I started focusing on that. Well, in school, after two years of playing the tuba, I thought I'm going to I'm gonna jump off a bridge if I have to play one more note on the tuba. Like, <laughs> I knew that Funny was Funny how that happens, yeah, isn't I it? Would, that was not what I wanted to do. So I started, taking, <laughs> I started taking voice lessons and got in the choir and all that stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. So yeah, I still want to be a country music singer, but this is good stuff to know. So I graduated college bachelor's of music bachelor's of ba music industry and mm-hmm. uh had a lot of law classes like copyright law and not legal problems of the recording industry so a lot of recording classes based oh. out of nashville so that was very helpful back then um sure and every year that i was in college there was a theme park in nashville called opryland usa and i'm like uh-huh. they're not what i'm not what they're looking for they want skinny dancers who can sing blah 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 and so on a dare i went and i got hired to be in the show <laughs> to be in the show that I always wanted to be in. It was called Country Music USA. And it's an imitation show, a history of country music, imitation, you're imitating country stars past and present. And it changed my life. Because then I was Uh like, oh my gosh, I got to sing on the Grand Ole Opry as a solo artist that year. They came in the parks and picked some people out to sing as soloists. So I got to sing that year. Um, The next year, when I really was thinking about being a country music artist, friends of mine in the business were like, you can't be gay. This mm. isn't, you're, you're going to have to, they'll, they'll either buy you a girlfriend or a wife. Wow. You know, the label. The contract well, they'll, Yeah, they'll yeah. contract you a partner, a female wow. partner, um, or you find something else to do. And I'm like, no, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to be me. So what else could I do? Yeah. And people are like, well, you'd be great in musical theater. And I'm like, musical theater? What's that? Seriously. <laughs> and Les Miserables came to town doing the net first tour, first national tour auditions. Mm-hmm. And they came to Nashville. So I went and auditioned, and I got called back for Jean Valjean for the lead in the show. So they flew right. me to New York and had me sing up there for all the people. And they're like, well, we think you might be a little too young, but whatever. Like, you know, so we're going to keep having you come back and audition, you know, da da da. And I'm like, well, what else is out there? And a friend of mine said, oh my gosh. And I, I was always a fat kid, fat, 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 everything. I gauged my life by where my weight was. During that time. Oh, okay. So I was fat. And my second year at Opryland, I'd lost a bunch of weight. And so I was thinner. So after my third year at Opryland, uh, a friend of mine was like, you should audition for Chippendales. <laughs> and I was like, the chipmunks from Disney? He goes, no, the strippers. They're doing a show. It's called A Musical with Muscle. And it's going to open in the West End in London. And it's going to tour all over Europe. And they, they're looking for musical theater or pop perform pop singers that aren't strippers they're like the singers in the show and there's going to be like two guys in each show that are like one's a singer dancer and one is strictly a singer uh-huh. and i was like yes me fat me yes i need to be a chippendale so i they videoed me i sent it in and steve Banerjee, the then founder of chippendales called me from los angeles and offered me a job to be in the show. So I went to LA for six weeks and rehearsed, and this was 1992. He looked just like a jo- young George Michael. I looked like George Michael back then. They had me bleach my hair out blonde, so that's why oh now, my God, that's why now I've, I've done it again for, for what I'm doing now, but I, oh, yeah. I have my hair bleached <laughs> out. Um, 
But I went to went to Europe for a year and did this show. And while I was there, I auditioned for Miss Saigon for the lead. And they called me back like three times and then said they couldn't hire me because You're American. I'm American. <laughs> and so back then, they weren't necessarily doing that. They were hiring from the European community. Mm-hmm. And so, but they're like, when you get back to you know, the States, go to New York and tell our people and come to the audition. And I was too afraid. So I came back to the States a year later and was like, I'm going to go to Disney on vacation. This was 1993. Three. I came to Disney on my birthday, January, and auditioned and went to the audition and sang. And they're like, can you be here in two weeks? And I was oh like, my God. I was like, I don't have anything else lined up. Sure. So I moved down, moved over to Voices of Liberty, which then got me into being one of the Disney recording singers. So now I get booked for Disney singing, recording work for parades and shows and all that. I've mm-hmm. been doing that for nine, eight, 17 years, I mean, however long I've been here. Um, and so in 95, I got hired to be friends with Gaston in the live on stage Beauty and the Beast show. Mm-hmm. All this time, I kept going to New York like once or twice a year to audition for stuff. And they're like, you'd be great in Cats. And I was like, Cats? Is that, <laughs> is that still running? Isn't that dancers? And like, no, you could no, be old. forever. You could be old Deuteronomy and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. So I went up, auditioned, didn't get it. They came mm-hmm. back down like three months later to Orlando, had auditions for dancers. I went to that audition. They asked if I wanted to either do Old Deuteronomy on the road with the tour of Cats or be on Broadway as the understudy. And I said, Broadway, Broadway, I want the credit. So I got, oh, Cats. Yeah. I got Cats in New York, did that for two years until it closed, mm-hmm. came back and, to Disney. And that is your Old Deuteronomy, which is the Judy Dench role, correct? <laughs> yes, yes. Isn't that awesome? I love... <laughs> I don't you know can if judge another, yourself among the greats. I don't know of another industry where me, Ken Page, and Judy Dench can all play the same role. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yes. So yeah. So uh, so then I came back to Florida and got I auditioned for um, the Adventurers Club at Pleasure Island mm-hmm. and got hired for that. And so I did that for four years, which was probably still my favorite job I think I've, I've ever had oh, because you would go in and just right. laugh every night. Oh, and the people I, I worked with were these comedic geniuses that still, the <sighs> Sheila Ward, Mindy Wally Dietrich, Carl Oxtott, mm-hmm. or Carl Anthony, um, mm-hmm. John so, Conan, Glenn John, Gover, oh, yeah, yeah, Jay all Becker. Those, that, those were my people. That's when I was and there. Was Eric during that Pinder, time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally, yeah. Graham Murphy, all those people. The fact that I get to do Citizens with some of them, I'm like, okay, that kind of yeah. feels like a, some type of an achievement, but oh. Right I before know. I left, I recorded this song for, I was doing all the fireworks singing on the Disney fireworks shows and stuff, but for the Millennium, mm-hmm. I got to do the Millennium CD. I uh, did a song called Celebrate the Future Hand in Hand. Mm-hmm. which that's when that song was released. And uh, so I'm on that CD. So if you have that CD, it says Kurt Chimito. They left out the Vaughn and they left the out Vaughn. the S. They left out the Vaughn and the S. So it's C-H-M-I-T-T-O-U. Yeah. Anyway, C- they misspelled my name. Oh, and it, Chimito. And, Chimito. Yeah, Chimito. Okay. And then in 2005, at my heaviest, which was like 330 pounds, wow. I got hired for Broadway again for uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And so I went up and opened and closed that show all within a year. <laughs> uh, it was, wow. yeah, it was, it was, but I got to be on the Macy's parade. So the, that, that year when Chitty was on Macy's parade and it was like his number. Yeah. It was too sweet. Like, if you know the show, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is too sweet, too sweet. So like candy. he's the main soloist. Yeah. But it's me show. with everybody behind parade. us. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that about you. The, the blessing of that show was I got to actually work with, um, Robert and Richard Sherman, the Sherman brothers oh, yeah. that wrote all the music everybody knows from Disney. Just mm-hmm. look them. They wrote Mary Poppins. They wrote Winnie the Pooh. They wrote It's a Small World. You know, you just look them up. Yeah. They wrote everything. everything. So they are the ones. So yeah. the fact that I got to physically be there and work with them and know them that that was the highlight of that whole time. When that was over, uh, I auditioned while I was in New York. The show had already closed, but I had auditioned for Finding Nemo the musical that they were putting mm-hmm. together uh, with the Lopez, Kristen and Bobby Lopez, who Bobby wrote Avenue Q. Um, and I got hired for that as Bruce the Shark. So I opened that show as Bruce the Shark. I got injured a couple years into that and went and opened American Idol experience mm-hmm. at Disney. Mm-hmm. And while I was that had opened, I was just a sub with that. Zach was leaving Beauty and the Beast. So I went over and auditioned for Beauty and the Beast and they as Gaston again. And they said, Would you be interested in being full time? I was like, sure. So he left, and I took right his place. Right after I had right? turned on my contract. Yeah, he turned like, on his contract, oh, and they hired that. me. So 20, 
20 years later, I came back and played Gaston again for wow. five, five years. And five the longest years. stint anywhere. Yeah. yeah. 2010 wow. to 2015. And so I quit for a week. And in that time, Zach had come back from Vegas and did is was doing Bruce the Shark, which is what I used to do that's in Nemo. Of, and mm-hmm. we met when he like the first week or second week after he got back in town. That's Four when days we, after I got back to town. That's when we we met when I was single. I wasn't single the first time we met, so I was single at that time. And we had our first date on March twenty second, two thousand twelve, and got oh. married March twenty third, March twenty second, two thousand sixteen. So Aww. we've been married. I know we've been married over <laughs> four years now. So that's my Disney magic story. So I got this uh, Frozen sing along mm-hmm. for the summer. It's supposed to be a summer show. Fast forward three years later, that became a full time show, and I was still doing it. And so in 2017, two years later, I quit uh, November of 2017. I was because in that time, still doing my voiceover work, still doing recording work, and had been. I was in this group called Boctive, which is an acapella group. Um, that I am still in and now focusing 90.1% of my full time uh, mm-hmm. making Voctiv happen. And we've done really well. They're so and good. Several... Yeah, talk more about Voctiv as far as that's. I feel like if you've seen, if you're on social media or you're on the internet, you guys have had so many videos out that have kind of gone viral. Yeah. Of we you guys are singing these amazing songs. We put out a. It was a guy named Jamie Ray put us together. He's a, a young. A teacher at Rollins College here in Orlando and music professor and he had all this music and he knew us all from different studio gigs that we'd done the, the people mm-hmm. so he put a lot of people together and had us record some of his arrangements and one of them was this Disney fly medley it was all songs about flying so let's go mm-hmm. fly a kite and you can fly from Peter Pan and I see an elephant fly from Dumbo and so he just decided to film us in the studio while they're playing back the playback and we're singing along to it and so he filmed it put it on the internet Huffington Post picked it up and said, here's what Disney employees do when they're not in the parks. This is what they do in their spare time. (laughs) And it got like 40 million views or something. It was crazy. And so Kirsten Maldonado, who is the female vocalist in the group Pentatonix, if you've heard of Mm -hmm. them, she contacted Jamie and said, I would love for you to write a Disney love medley for me and her then boyfriend slash fiance. So we did that. And that I think that video at that time had gotten around 30 million views that we did with Kirsten. Kirsten. So that kind of put us on the map. So we started releasing videos and now we've gotten, we did um, Mary Did You Know with Mark Lowry. Who if wrote. You, who wrote the song Mary Did You Know. For the 25th anniversary, he had Jamie do an arrangement and so we did that and it was on his Christmas CD and on our Christmas CD and it's gotten the most views of any video we've ever done. It's like, wow. right now it's 70 million something I think is where we are in the in the count. So we've, we have over like 200 million social media video views That's right now great. and we've been together and you've sung years. with other famous people too you sang with sandy patty <clears throat> sandy patty we did beauty and the beast with her <laughs> um 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 whom I've, david phelps who's a really famous tenor um did being alive with us jody mcbrayer who's a contemporary christian singer did uh someone like you from jekyll and hyde and we're also doing a Prince of Egypt medley that people have been screaming for us to do for like do Prince of Egypt, do Prince of Egypt. That's mm-hmm. so yeah. So we're doing good, and we are jonesing. We had so many concerts and stuff that got canceled because of all this social distancing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're hoping the Christmas tour, um, which we start doing some stuff in November. So we're hoping all the, yeah, fingers crossed that we'll still. Mm. Get to go yeah. back out and do that. Um, I'm sorry. This yeah. was 45 minutes of talking about me. I can't. I can't. <laughs> no, it's, I'm sorry. I'm, I am enwrapped because, I'm like so I said, sorry. I don't know you or your career. Well. It, it's funny it's how often I'm talking or, if again, if we were in my home, I'm sitting with my friends, people I consider my friends that I think I know. And, and have learn. them tell me things. I'm like, I never knew you did that. Yeah. Oh yeah, my God. I love that you do this. It's like yeah. a structured way of getting to know more about the people around you. Well, my favorite thing, lovely. Chippendales is my favorite thing. When I tell people, people that oh I did God. Chippendales and they're like, that's your, <laughs> and so the fact that I was ever at Chippendales, I want Guinness Book of World Records to come and be like, <laughs> certify me as the world's fattest Chippendale. World's <laughs> Are, yes. <laughs> the world's most out of shape Chippendale. Like his BMI at the time wow. was 37. <laughs> And other Chippendale men were two. That was their BMI. Their body mass indexes were two. And he was a 37. Wow. But, Amazing. yeah, my life is crazy. I need a good book. <laughs> 
Well, I I, I cannot believe I'm so happy that I got the two of you to sit down together. Yay. Two amazing guys with amazing careers. But you know what? Enough about you. Okay, exactly. We have Can to we... get back. So we're back at the Edna's Edibles. Um, <laughs> I'm always fascinated by the busy work that they're doing now in the in the store. For we used to have the busy work in the cafeteria. The one table. Yeah. Wiping right. that they, one table. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing in the cafeteria of the old of the old show okay. was that they would. Um, just occurred to me. I, it wouldn't hurt me to like double, triple check. My my audio stuff is still. Tick tick. Yeah, we're going. Uh, Two hours. Lord, this is gonna be a long voice memo. And uh, <laughs> so um. Edit for weeks. So the deal is, like you know, you see them cleaning up the tables. There's yeah. never any food. All there would be crumpled napkins on plates. That was yeah. it. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, okay. So Blair is putting plastic wrap over some sort of a tray that looks like it has lettuce on it. I don't know what the fuck it is. Anyway, I just <laughs> thought I'd throw that out there. So we learn that Tootie is scrambling to write the skits for this senior spoof night yeah. and that Natalie's been joining all these clubs, the French club, the German club. She's everywhere, hanging out at the bookstore in the student union. And the girls are having to cover for her for her uh, at the shop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So but they don't mind. They like the overtime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it is payday and Mrs. Garrett gives the girls their checks and in comes Natalie. She's like, oh, I was having coffee with friends. I lost track of time. What do you need me to do? And Mrs. Garrett says, well. <laughs> what, what did she say? Tell me. I'm sorry. Like, well, well you can put the clothes sign up. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost Paul Lind. He's it's like, almost a little Charles ooh, Nelson Riley meets. She and he went to school it's together. Like, Oh, well, there you go. She it's and Paul Lind were best friends in oh, college. It's oh Charles Nelson Riley is who I was thinking of, but Paul Lind, too. He's got a little bit yeah, of that Paul thing Lind. in there. Yeah. Yeah. So then Tootie goes to Natalie and says, um, could you help us out with these skits for the the senior spoof? And Natalie's like, I wrote the skits. I gave them to you. And, and Tootie's like, yeah, and they're lousy. The committee meeting pretty much rejected them and said you can do better. And... Natalie says, well, maybe the jokes are over your head. Ooh. And Joe's response, you want me to kill her for you? Yeah. <laughs> that escalated yeah. quickly. <laughs> it did. Well. <laughs> so then yeah. Mrs. Uh, Garrett intervenes, and Natalie even drops a thing of, I don't have time for kid stuff. You know, she's so mature right. and so adult. She's been taking a, a course at a college for However many weeks, weeks it's been. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And then this is probably the peak of Natalie's bitchery. And it is now about to all come crashing down. Mm -hmm. Boots shows up with the college newspaper. <sighs> and she goes to read the article that she wrote about herself. And she's like, this isn't what I wrote. And Boots is like, no, they edited you. And she's like, what do you mean they edited me? I'm an editor. I'm the editor of the school paper. And she's like, well, that's a high school paper. That's not the big potatoes like a college. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Snooty, snooty, snooty. And, and a great response. Natalie says, I wrote some really good stuff. And Bootsy says, well, maybe that's what you should have turned in. Ooh. Ooh. Burn. Where is the married with children audience when you need them? Oh, my God. <laughs> And then she does a signature <laughs> hair flip. That's right. After I she know. gets her Ooh! pate. Yes. And walks out the door. <laughs> uh-huh. So then the next, uh, the, as this is starting to crumble down, first we have the article. Then Mrs. Garrett gives her her paycheck. And the great line, Natalie's like, what, was this edited too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great imitation. And that was one of those lines where she paused for the laugh that didn't come. That didn't happen, yeah. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. cricket, cricket. But she's like, yes. $18. And then Mrs. Garrett makes the, the tells her that she only worked seven days, I think. No, seven, 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 seven hours. Oh, was it seven she hours? Was she was scheduled for 16, 16 hours. hours. Yeah. And, and you only... missed nine. Yes. So she you worked, worked seven, seven hours. hours. It made, two years, it so. made $18. So okay, yeah, her, her take home pay was less than three dollars an hour. Is that yeah. good for 1983? Yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, really? like I remember being oh, in high God. school, like 80, you know, 85. And 86. also, they're living there, so maybe that's oh, right. I was gonna say, like, your sort of basic rate of you know, like a high school job you'd get 
uh, would like you know four dollars an hour was kind of like what you made at wow, Burger King yeah. okay and that sort of a deal it was low but four four dollars an hour was kind of like you, you wouldn't work for less than that okay and then like like Zach just said it's like and uh basically room and border <laughs> yeah, included yeah true. In that, okay so. okay that makes sense okay okay I feel yeah, better about there's, that there's almost a little part of me that as we have gotten into only seven weeks of this arrangement where they get to live there and they also are they working off so part of me is kind of like oh do it's, they get paid it's should never they fully get paid? explained yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i feel like it should be okay you live here you are therefore required to put in x amount of hours hours yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and Makes then sense. anything over that that's considered overtime then you start making an hourly rate right and then if you girls want to switch or if some, one of you is busy and someone wants to take two shifts and double up, it's just like whatever you fucking need. Yeah, yeah I have and, a feeling whoever wrote these episodes or the show or these episodes didn't think that deeply about yeah. about what is the structure of their living and yeah. pay payment arrangement. No. Yeah. Hell no, they didn't give that any thought. <laughs> right. a fair we wage. care too much, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, Natalie then reveals she needs money because she has charged her Langley charge card to the max over at the college bookstore. Yes. And another great Mrs. Garrett line. Straight to the what? camera. You have a Langley charge card. I'm doing a terrible impression, I, believe, I know. Are well, you? I, be- I believe... <laughs> I believe, first of all, Mrs. Garrett was sitting there in complete shadows that entire scene. She's sitting in the middle of that couch, which was not lit, and she's blocked by Natalie's shadow. So I'm just like, lighting people, get her yeah. out of the shadow. It drives me crazy. Mm-hmm. But then I also think this is the beginning of her dementia. Oh. <laughs> because I noticed this episode, she, Mrs. Garrett observes every single thing that's happened, other than the stuff at the student lounge. But she's observed every single thing that's happened, but then is taken by surprise. What? You're not writing the paper? You're not doing You've got a charge card? You're, you're going to drop out of school? And I'm like, you just heard her say that. I'm like, what? what's wrong with you? Yeah. And you yeah. live together. That yeah. wouldn't have come about somehow? Yeah. And so but I think you... that's that's the dementia setting in. We're finally seeing Mrs. It. Garrett's, not Charlotte yeah. Ray's. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. no, 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 no Mrs. Charlotte Garrett's, yeah. 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 Okay. So there is a joke here. I don't know if you uh, caught it. Mrs. Garrett, do you, when she says, you have a Langley charge card. Remember what Natalie's well response is? No. Oh, wait, she's like, she says, no, I can't remember it. I don't leave home without it. Oh, <laughs> oh I forgot about that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Zach, nice. what is that a reference to? I know Kurt. Oh, that's knows. American Zach. Express, right? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's American I mean, because they use that well. I wasn't born yesterday, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I have no idea how recent that is. To me, that was a thing when I was a kid, like with yeah. Carl Malden. Yeah, because traveler's checks were a big thing back then, too. And that, American that's Express right. traveler's checks. Don't leave home with, you know. <laughs> traveler's so, checks. I know. That's with a cue. Like, no. That, that may as well be a tablet with a hammer and chisel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you cave, think of what a... Cave paintings and traveler's checks I kind of I just know. go hand in hand. <laughs> what is that, Regis? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> So um, <laughs> then Mr. Parker shows up and, and he continues has, to crash and continues to crash before he talks about what Provost McGovern. We've not heard this name before. I don't know if we'll hear it again from Langley. <laughs> he's like, have you heard from him? And he, she says, no. And he's like, good. He's going to be contacting you to cater an event. And even my though wife. you're not my private caterer anymore, my wife's birthday party is coming up. And basically, I don't own you anymore, but I'm just calling to make sure you, I still own you, right? <sighs> yeah, he says, I own you. That's what he says. I own like, you. Or, or I Even still, though you don't I work still, still do. I, Even yeah. I no longer, I and still she do. says, oh, you do. <laughs> But, uh, all that's missing is the ball gag. And then a ball gag a, and a whip in that scene. That's all that very, I still own and, you. And, and you want long. more of my strudel. <laughs> While quietly and a in the private background. private cook's tour. <laughs> in the background, let's play master and servant. It's playing in the background. Yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> but then she brings up his wife. So is she involved? Probably. Or is it a We've, secret affair? They met at a key party. No, it's a three-way. It's a whole cuck situation. It's oh, just... Oh, wow. What? What? Okay. What? I'm sorry. We're, we're getting I, into it now. Did I go too far? Wow. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't know if he's going to teach you. I don't mind. My, my virgin ears. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> but the other news he brings <laughs> is that Natalie, 
Her grades have been slipping. She has a few C's, a couple of incompletes, and she's been cutting classes. Natalie, you've been cutting classes. See, I can't do her. I can't do her like Zach does. You guys do her great. I love you. But again, bum. how does she not know that she's been cutting classes? How, like, Wait, exactly? Is it just because she's hanging like out at the student union? <laughs> <laughs> So Langley has rescinded the offer of early admission. She's not going to skip her senior year Thank at God. Eastland. Thank God. And uh, crisis averted. Yeah, right. And oh, oh, speaking of crisis averted, he says to her, Natalie, I am still your headmaster, and I can make it tough on girls who cut classes. Yeah. <laughs> Do we understand each other? That Dark. creeped me out. And I, it's a girl's school, so that's why. Yeah. He should have said students, not girls. That was a bad choice of words because yeah. that creepy that in, this, that in this day and age does yeah. not. But, but the deal is, it's like she's cut the classes and she's not denying it. She's yeah. saying, "Yep, <laughs> right." It, it, it should have been like, "You're going to screw up your future. Mm. Why not well, it, take a moment and reflect and realize you're you're messing up." You're you're too far ahead. Like, there's a good version of this speech just mm-hmm. waiting to be yeah. said. I would have it be, um, uh, Natalie cutting classes is a punishable offense, and I yeah. just I, I, it'll be fun for him to do. Uh, I hear okay. I'm, I'm I'm writing this in my head. Have him <laughs> say so regarding the cutting classes, Natalie. You know that's a punishable offense, and I could really throw the book at you. But on the one hand. You've lost your ability to go to Langley early. I figure, why hit a girl while she's while she's down? And Easy. maybe if I'm nice to you, <laughs> uh, I don't. Easy. Like Mrs. Garrett likes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then I was gonna what I what I later thought of was then he'd say, and I also thought maybe if I go easy on you, Edna, <laughs> you might be sure to. Go hard on me. Write my wife's party in ink in your calendar. Oh, oh okay. that's smart. Really connects See, the, the random joke reason for him yeah. to be there in the first place. Um, yeah. Just connecting yeah. those dots. But at the very least, he needs to say, I could like a, and should punish you now. Yeah. Right? It's like, well, you've already lost this privilege. You've already lost this privilege. You're going to have to work crazy hard to bring your grades back up so you yeah. can get into college in the first place. Yeah. Why not? Like, that's punishment enough. Yeah. I could You're, make it even worse. Like, you really should be punished even more. But, I, you know, like, and then have her have a moment of actually being remorseful. Because she yeah. doesn't. She's still super snooty about it. it. It's just, it's so weirdly written. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you there. And I will put that in my notes to the writers, which I always <laughs> send back in my time machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we have... The last exchange, and this is uh, the last exchange where we oh, never see Mr. Have. Parker again. Oh. He oh. says, well, uh, we're done here. He's like, Natalie, blah, blah, blah. Edna, please come back to Eastland. We Mic have drop. all new ice cream. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> and, and she says, no. And then she just says, bye-bye, Charles. And <laughs> like forever. 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 <laughs> forever. She's yeah. like, yeah. You have wow. ice cream. Oh you God. don't need me anymore. <laughs> what a weird priority. Oh. oh, my goodness. So, Natalie has learned her lesson, hasn't she? I yeah. thought she got it because she says... No, we're to... in the last minutes of the show and Natalie still doesn't fucking get it. She goes to Mrs. Garrett and says, Okay, if you write a letter to Langley... And tell them that the reason why I've been slacking is because I've been oh, working right. extra hard at the store. Right, sorry. Oh, then maybe ahead. I yes. could. Do- and Mrs. Garrett literally says to her, you want me to lie for you? Forget it. Yeah. And it's like, what were you? Really? Yeah. You think Mrs. Garrett would fucking do that? <laughs> right. I was so taken aback by all the honey oak on the set. <laughs> oh, my God. That I, can, I couldn't even. I missed, I missed that line. I think I actually missed it because I was like, there is too much honey oak. <laughs> There is too, there's <laughs> nothing. This entire set is honey oak. It's it is, making me want to vomit. It is 80s-tastic. Like, it is so much of it is 80s-tastic. Right. Sorry. So I'm, I think I might have missed that. You want me to lie for you? I remember, yeah. yeah. That's right. I forgot about it. But yeah, so, totally. So, and then, She's finally, comes the dawn. Oh, and Mrs. Yeah, Garrett you says, think? you're not ready for college now. You've yeah. got to earn the ability to go by hard work. And she says, face it. You blew it. 
You got a warning yeah. from a headmaster. Yeah, Your grades are in the shitter. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. <laughs> Your parents no. are going to be upset at you. And you've insulted and humiliated your friends. Right. And Natalie's like, oh, fuck. Oh. Did I do all shit? Yeah. I did. Like, and it, then, t- it took that. It and took then she, all it of took that, that for her to realize. It cataloging yeah. it. Yeah. And then and then she should have said yeah, and now you're asking me the Tell literally most honest woman on the face of the planet to right. lie for you. Really? I feel like before Tootie comes in, there should have been a final muffy boots scene. I feel like boots he needed to come back and sort of oh. get Natalie's like, you know what? I don't need you and I don't need people. I you know, Natalie yeah. needed a sort of I'm okay on my own, and I don't need to be a big shot, blah, blah, blah. And I never got that resolved. So Yes, kind of that like, would have been a great... Yeah, that would have been a good way to do that. Because she needed a moment where she was like... Where you saw that she learned her lesson. You never got the moment where she sees... I mean, she has the moment of like, oh, I did all that? But then to like drive it home with the... Yeah, because... I, I don't need to be a big shot at college by sucking up to boots. And maybe Tootie could have seen that happen... And then when Natalie goes over and doesn't realize she's seen it and goes, oh, my friends, blah, blah, blah. Then it would have been funny when she goes, yeah, right. The yeah, oh, now I'm going to have to eat yeah. some pro for a yeah. while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that would have been I, a little more tongue-in-cheek than just like... I like that. To me, what it this is also <clears throat> magnifying is the fact that where Natalie fucked up is kind of independent of this relationship with Bootsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Bootsy thing almost seems extraneous. Like, we didn't even need to have the yeah. dry cleaning and the helping her pack. Yeah, that no, was, they were, they was, was like they were trying to find ways to write Boots into the show more. Bingo. Yeah. I and, think it was trying to give Jamie Gertz yeah. more material. Yeah, and now I get the idea of, oh, Natalie's found a new person to model herself on. Like, yeah. uh, oh, well, maybe I can be like this girl, and that's a way for me to be successful. But then the moment of realizing, oh, I don't need to do that. Yeah, and I'm we never the, got the easy way to do it, and the t- and a typically cheesy sitcom device that could have been used here is why not have Natalie start dressing like Bootsy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Why totally. not have her wear her hair bigger? Why not have Natalie take on a new physical persona? Yeah. To demonstrate that she is not being herself, or, or even like mimic her vocally more than she yeah, just does. The one she has the one. T- but that's yeah. it. Yeah, like there's not really a... Well, it's, 20, yeah. it's 22 minutes. They did what they could. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, they could have modified the language as far as the, you know, what do you mean? I wrote these sketches and they're fine. I don't do rewrites and I don't do punch up and stuff. She could have been playing that more. Oh, Tootie, that's so sweet of you. But I think you'll find that these are perfectly wonderful and they will get all the laughs you yeah, possibly could want. Uh, totally. She could be more condescending. Well, yeah, she and they're like, you know line. you're sounding a lot like little Miss Bootsy or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. But, yeah, but, yeah. She, but she did and, have the line about it sounding sophomoric. And she goes, well, I am a sophomore. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I had that line in the thing. So I'm like, oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Yes, indeed. And then, uh, and then she turns around and asks for... Tootie's for Natalie turns around and asks for Tootie's forgiveness. Yeah, tell us that. Tell us that With, line. What does she say there? Not David? is it really forgiveness? I think she asks. She's asking more for asking support. For, oh, my friend to be here in my time of need. Yeah, yeah. no, totally. Yeah, it's not absolutely. Yeah. You're right. She's not asking for there's, forgiveness. There's no. I'm and sorry there at all. She is at true. True. Sorry. Thank you. Good point. Mm-hmm. She, and she's and and the tone of her voice is so. Well, it's Disney Channel acting, is what it is. But it's yes. so like, oh, woe is me. I have oh. like, it's no, I fucked up. It's woe is me. I'm my life's in this terrible place. I hope you can support me. But it like, yeah. and what is Tootie's no say? genuine? What's Tootie's? Nothing genuine. What's Tootie's reply? And to uh, go fuck yourself. Yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah. much. Yeah. No. yeah oh, oh, oh right. no. Oh, actually, no. I did write down Tootie's response, yes. and it is ridiculous. I know, right? She says, Psh, "Don't hold your breath, bozo." Bozo, that was it. Oh, I knew she God. called her a, a something. I was like, "Bo." We joke about the middle-aged vaudevillian writers who are yeah. putting <laughs> words into the mouths of teenagers here. Doesn't John uh-huh. Mulaney? Um, Oh my God, Doesn't John Mulaney do a bit about something like some headline, like for the New York Post, says, "Take a hike, bozo." <laughs> it's I don't know. you know, it's like. You know, Mia Farrow to Woody Allen. Take a hike, bozo. 
And the idea that using the term bozo, bozo. Yeah. is so has, antiquated. Has yeah. ever been appropriate. No. Or has ever sounded appropriate since the... No. Whenever, oh. That's right. No, now that Cla- was... Clara Bow will come out and change the title card for our next act. <laughs> Calling somebody bozo, that went out with button <laughs> shoes. <laughs> 20 degrees can do. So, uh, thankfully, the comeuppance we are finally getting for Natalie to satisfy us as audience members is Tootie runs into the other room and basically says, Hey, Blair Joe! Natalie's fucked it all up and she's getting shit for it. Woo! And the girls are laughing and Mrs. Garrett just sits on the couch <laughs> reacting. Yeah. I just like to imagine all the girls are punching Natalie. We don't <laughs> yeah. see it. They're they're all laughing, but they're actually beating her. They're just punching her. Or they've got just French bread rolling, just flogged. beating her. <laughs> baguettes. Yeah, baguettes. Yeah. Beating her with baguettes. <laughs> yeah. They're just beating her. Since you don't hear her because the girls are speaking no. so loudly. Oh, I'm taking that extra death pate and just fling yeah. it. That's um, and with that reaction... We get the credits rolling, and we hear the audience applaud. So, gentlemen, we've come to the end of another show. Oh, Aww. we took the good. We took the bad. Uh, yes. We took them both. And, and there we had. <laughs> no, different show. Just the facts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And there was some good, and there was some bad. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how we didn't realize at the time that theme song was literally telling us. Hey, <laughs> every week you're going to see some good shit and you're going to see some bad shit. You're welcome. Yeah. Gentlemen, I am so happy that we were able to make the time and I was able to interview both fun. of you yeah. together. Thank yeah. you for making this happen. This yeah. is great. It's yeah, it's great. And the best thing about a pandemic is people really can't say no. It's like, what, <laughs> you got something better to do? <laughs> I don't oh, think I'll so. I'll washing my hair that night. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We're washing each other that night. Well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so thank you so much. I hope we are able to do this again. And uh, smooches and goodbye. Awesome. Bye, David. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And there you have it. That was Zach Nadalski and Kurt Von Schmido. God, they are just so sweet and nice and talented and attractive. And I, I think I hate them a little bit. I'm just going to say that right here. I'm going to be vulnerable and tell you. They are so awesome. It kind of makes me a little bit mad. Yeah. Anyhow, next week I'm going to be watching Season 5, Episode 8, I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can, and my very special guest is going to be Megan Maroney. She is back. I'm so excited. You can watch the episode for free at dailymotion.com, and I'll put the link in the show notes and on this episode's webpage. That's all for now. Thank you so much for listening to this week's show, and remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was produced, written, hosted, and edited by me, David Almeida. My theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Our website is facethefactspod.com. You have to drop the let's. And that's where you can find extra pictures, video, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor. Follow the show on social media. We're everywhere under the handle Face the Facts Pod. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com slash face the facts pod. And don't forget, go to your favorite podcatchers and subscribe, rate, and review. Tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts. <laughs>